European Association of Service Providers for Persons with Disabilities, acknowledges the use of inappropriate language within this documentary that some viewers may find offensive. European Association of Service Providers for Persons with Disabilities does not condone the use of this language, but does not wish to alter the words of other individuals. A city just like many others. Beginning of September 2022, the West regions of Ukraine look calm. Sandbag fortifications on some of the administrative buildings in Lviv are a reminder of the ongoing war. There are signs of bombings in the outskirts, but they've already been repaired. The downtown attractions in the tourist city are much like most Western capitals. Ukraine caused reforms. The Military Equipment Exposition in downtown Lviv raises the patriotic spirit. Some of the exhibits are claimed to be abandoned, captured Russian machines used in battle after February 24th, although the situation in most of Ukraine is now calm and there are no more air raid sirens. Kids are used to playing soldiers, such as in the case in the orphanage in Ternopil. Before February 24, 2022, Ukraine initiated reforms of the institution for orphaned children and children with disabilities. The idea is to follow the European model and encourage their placement in a home environment and to reorganize boarding schools into daycare centers for rehabilitation and social activities. The first center in Ukraine to implement the directive to close down boarding schools is the one in Ternopil. On February 24, 2022, instead of having the Minister of Economy cut the ribbon on the new building and officially start the reform, Ukraine was bombed and the reforms were put on hold. Instead of opening a daycare center, we began setting up a bomb shelter. We packed everything and made special units for the kids that arrived. Is that a gun? No, that's not a gun. These children are only a fraction of the thousand minors abandoned by their parents, taken away by court order, or abandoned with a disability who call the orphanages all over Ukraine their home. Russia raids on Ukraine forced the government to evacuate children to the western part of the country. Children from orphanages in Kyiv arrived to Chernobyl. These children have no parents. They're aged between four and seven. Their activities follow the national kindergarten programs. Some are healthy, others not so much. However, they're active and socialized. At first, it was hard for the children to adapt because bombs were falling in Kyiv right when they were boarding the train. They heard the blasts, the sirens, the flying planes nearby. It was hard for them here in the beginning, especially when we had to go down to the shelter where the air raid sirens were on. The first few days after February 24th, the children and staff of the institution in Ternopil were staying here, in the building's basement. This is our primitive shelter. We set it up just to have a place to hide. On February 24th, when we came down here, we were all in shock. No one was expecting that the situation would be so scary and so serious. We heard the first sirens here just before midnight. I immediately came here as well as the staff members who were living nearby. The children along with four staff members would sleep here. 
We would bring them food down here. Sometimes the state of emergency would go on for hours. On March 3rd, when the kids from Kyiv arrived, we had much more work because to the 30 kids we had, were added 55 more that we had no beds for at the time. We've never had so many children in here. It was a shock. The children had been on the road for more than 24 hours and were rather agitated. In a few days, stress made them ill with high fever. It was stressful for everybody, for them and for us. The adjustment period was hard for the staff, but gradually it all fell into place and we got used to the situation. We needed beds and mattresses, so we asked the mayor for help. There was no panic, no shock. The staff pulled themselves together. My colleagues from the administration and I have been here from the start to set an example. We wanted to send a message that everything was organized and under control. For the first two months they were understaffed, but now there are 15 new staff members leading up to a total of 125, including administration. They look after about 100 children, including 10 who attend only daycare rehabilitation. Well done! Excellent! The team's greatest challenge is working with children with complex disabilities. Nine children from Kyiv came to the palliative care unit. The youngest was six months old, the oldest was 12 years old. They all have serious disabilities. Each group has a nurse, a teacher and an assistant. Our staff had to learn how to work with such kids because they had no previous experience. In palliative care, our main goal is to limit any pain for the children. We do whatever possible to provide them comfort. They require specific care in terms of feeding and looking after. War forced us to acquire many new skills. <laughs> They're not like ordinary children, that's why we've provided a bigger space for physical exercises, massages. They're only able to lie down. We're talking about complicated children with unpredictable conditions. That's why we have an oxygen concentrator. The hospital is across the street where we could take them in case of serious crisis. Ukraine's legislation bans adoption of children to mothers diagnosed with psychiatric illness. Therefore, even if a child is healthy, they remain in an institution. A few days ago we received a two-month-old baby who was taken away from the parents because they forgot to feed him. They were playing computer games and couldn't find the time to feed the baby. The court will decide if the child will be put up for adoption or returned to the parents. The sensory room and the rehabilitation machines were financed through donations. The staff hoped that the war would end and the plans to reorganize the institution into a rehabilitation center would come to fulfillment. Until then, there are more urgent changes at hand. Next week, reconstruction of the bomb shelter will begin. It might sound weird, but it needs to be done. UNICEF provided security for for the windows, and they're now fortified against shattering. Even if there are shells, we would be safe because the windows have been covered in foil. Five hours away, by car from Ternopil, the city of Mukachevo is located. When the area was part of the Soviet Union, Bulgarian heroes of the socialist labor helped with the progress of local agriculture. Today, the downtown Lenin Monument has been replaced by the monument of the brothers Kiro and Methodius. In Mukachevo, a boarding school is located for children with mild to moderate intellectual disabilities. Director Vasily Yurovich Markunin has been managing the board school for 40 years. Despite him being investigated for irregularities, he's received merits award by the city council. Markunin says that as of March 2022, to the 110 residents under the care of the staff of 73, 
22 more have been added, evacuated from an establishment in Donetsk. These children do not correspond to our profile. 93% of the children here have never lived with their actual parents. More than 90% are gypsies. Gypsies are also people. The children with retardation from Donetsk are all difficult cases in very bad medical condition. When I started working here 40 years ago, the state was compensating us for working with such cases. Now there's no compensation anymore, no bonuses, they've cut all additional funding. There is war. They warned us to be prepared to accommodate more children. We're preparing for that. We've done everything we could. What the future holds is yet unclear. It's a girls-only establishment, which is not evident because of the short haircuts. So when UNICEF volunteers gave the kids hairpins and bracelets, there was joy all around. Look, there's a pink one for you. The Donetsk children are not able to speak and have been diagnosed with moderate, severe and profound intellectual disabilities. The children were admitted at 3 o'clock at night on March 13th, dirty, sick and full of lice. It took four of us to carry one of the children. The soldiers who brought them to the station handed them to us. We took them to the rehabilitation center. Our biggest problem is accommodating them and providing proper living conditions. We've requested assistance from all relevant institutions with the reconstruction of our facilities to prepare for the winter. To be honest, our staff is not experienced to deal with such children. They're used to working with other types of children. These children require three times as much attention as our resident children. A team of UNICEF-trained psychologists helped to train the staff new skills to communicate with children with more complex disabilities. You put down three pictures with different objects, then you ask the child to give you a specific one. When they give you the right one, you put up another picture. It's a method developed for children who cannot speak, so that they can indicate some need. They've never had such children here. Most children were able to speak and keep personal hygiene. Now we're teaching the staff. I've never worked with such children. We have had complicated cases, but not to such an extent. We've taught our children to be self-dependent from an early age, to bathe, to make their beds. They've learned basic reading and math and are able to socialize, whereas those children are unable to wash themselves. We have to do it instead. Some of them need help with getting dressed as well. Teaching them will take time. Uh, they don't speak, so due to their type of disability and mental retardation, but they can communicate, so we are speaking. Otherwise, there will be uh, other complications, like sometimes uh, we hear like complaining that uh, they have bad behavior, they are aggressive, self-aggressive, or because they cannot communicate out, they cannot express what th their needs are. Although it is a boarding school for girls up to 18 years of age, there are quite a few adult women, some of them in their late 40s, the diagnosis in their files indicates some form of developmental delay, but with no disability. The school is their only home, and no effort has been made towards their socialization. My name is Mariana. I'm 29. I like working and helping. We have a pilot project here in our region, in one, uh, it's called Parasolka. Also, they are getting a lot of support and trainings uh, through a committee of medical aid, it's another NGO. And uh, from Switzerland, uh, there are experts who are coming and teaching. And so we are pi piloting, piloting, and now we have to really extend that. I want a different life. I want to work. I'm not crazy. I'm a sane girl. Help me, please. According uh, to um, the medical uh, 
documents of these girls, they all have kind of light mental retardation. Some of them, of course, should need supported living, supported workshops, living out of this institution. So we are just taking the first steps in that pro process and uh, I wish it was happening faster. She's my favorite. It's still typical for Ukraine to have institutions of such a type. But again, it's not only about the financing. It's about the mind shift, and that's the most important and the most difficult side of it. One supervisor is responsible for 30 girls, says Viktoria Senkovits, a staff member for 18 years, now deputy director of the establishment in Mukachevo. The staff relies on older residents to cope with the newcomers from Donetsk. And for now, older girls have a chance to leave only if they get married. Some of the girls have met boys who were working at the places we've taken them on vacation. When we came back, they wanted to get married. One of the boys was our bread supplier. We've already had three weddings. The girls went to good families. Here we've taught them that they are women, mothers, wives, and what's to be expected of them. We try to create habits for them, to keep a tidy house, to be able to sew a button, basic stuff every woman should be able to do. For 18 years, ever since Victoria has been working here, there have been no adoptions, but the girls are free to go out every Sunday. If they behave during the week on Sunday, they can go wherever they want. If their behavior hasn't been satisfactory, they won't go out. So that's a way to motivate them to behave within the group. The naughtiest ones get more responsibilities, and that's proven effective. The Karpatia region, where Mukachevo is located, is near the borders with four EU countries. According to the municipality records, 400,000 refugees passed through here since February 2022. 155,000 stayed in the area. They're domestic migrants from the war in the east of the country. There are 30 regional and 14 district institutions for people who are homeless or have a disability, where 1,500 people are accommodated. 250 evacuees with disabilities have been distributed among the establishments. Victor Matsola, the district social activity director, admits that the EU social services regulation requirements voted four years ago are still valid only on paper. We have the perfect legal framework, but its content is not being enforced due to budgetary and organizational issues. There's a lack of specialists. The facilities are outdated. It all comes down to financing and doesn't happen overnight. The process has begun, and it's the municipality's responsibility to improve social activities. But I am hoping for a change in state legislation so that the state budget would allocate more funding to regional social establishments. We must meet the requirements, but it's our problem to figure out how. I believe it's the same in Bulgaria. The Uzhurut Rehabilitation Center is funded solely by donations. It provides daycare, social activities and housing to individuals with disabilities. The center was established in 1999 by parents of children with disabilities. It's called Optimist. Oleg Kirilenko, its manager, is one of its founders. I did it mainly because I have a child diagnosed with cerebral palsy. At first, it was only five or six children and a small budget for reconstruction and salaries. But after 22 years, we have a staff of 74. Natalia is a teacher at the center. She is a refugee from Mariupol. I enjoy working with such children. In Mariupol, I've been doing it for 18 years. This is Mikhailo and this is Kola. We've made progress with the tower out of blocks. This exercise consists of tying laces. Show me how you're threading the lace. Can you do that? There's a lace. Start from the top on this side. Come on, well done. 
We're working closely with the parents, as far as the child's preferences are concerned, so that we could get along with them and be helpful. The Uzgurod Rehabilitation Center is Luba's new home as well. She and her sons left the city of Pokrost in the Donetsk region. The trip took 24 hours. Imagine, in a small train compartment for two, we were three people. We took turns sleeping. Roma was in his wheelchair. I even helped the woman, I gave her diapers. The station of Pokrovsk had been hit by a rocket. The tracks have been damaged, and for a few days no one could leave. What's worse is that Donetsk region is so damaged that there's no gas, no water, no lighting. Luba's 39-year-old son is bedridden with a progressive illness. They said he'd get treatment here, but it's full of children. Luba still doesn't know how she's going to find the necessary treatment, but the rehabilitation center is in their home, and she's not complaining. I dreamt of visiting the Carpathians, and now we traveled, I could see the snowy peaks through the train windows. I was delighted. I used to dream of visiting Crimea. I went there with a few kids at camp. It was a nice place. I might have never been able to travel. It's so expensive. This is my home, the first city in the Russian troops' path. Just like Luba from Pokrovsk, Yulia from Rubezhne arrived by evacuation train from Luhansk. Yulia and 10-year-old Mikola settled down in Lviv. My name is Yulia. I'm from the region of Luhansk. I was born there, and I've lived there all my life. It's where I started my family. Unfortunately, on March 31st, we were forced to abandon our home and evacuate by train to Lviv. My home, Rubizhne, was under attack. I'm the head of my family. I have a 22-year-old daughter, a son, Mikola, who's with special needs and soon turns 10, and my 82-year-old mother. One. What's next? Two. Then it's three. And then what? Exactly, four. We have four toys here. I wasn't counting on the disability benefits. I was a gym teacher at a local school. Mikola had a personalized school plan and special teachers. On March 4th, the city was under attack. There were problems with electricity, gas. On March 15th, projectiles started flying overhead and the window broke. The building is burning. But we've already lived through 2014. We were waiting for our people to come. We were hoping that it would only take a few days, and then our people would come and bring peace. So the first projectile wasn't a big deal for us. We taped the windows, and since we had a lot of stuffed toys at home, we used them as insulation to keep warm. The next day the shooting became more intense, and on March 19th, a shell fell in through the window. Awful. I grew up here, and now the balcony is hanging by a thread. The walls rocked. The blast wave made a mess in the house. We were afraid to stay there. Yulia and her family are now safe, but she still remembers the weeks they spent in the basement with the neighbors. There was no connection, nothing. But we still believed that they will come to find us. Nobody came. No help from anywhere. We could go for water two blocks away from the shelter. But those 200 meters were terrible. They were shooting, dropping bombs. 
You get the water, but the blast wave knocks the bucket over. You go back and fill it up again. In the basement, we'd see and hear the shells flying. Phosphorus bombs, cluster bombs, tanks. One day we were praying to survive, as we were under fire for 12 hours straight. There were intensive strikes, and I was trying to say a prayer, to read, Dear Lord, but as I'd start reading, a bomb would explode, and so on and so on. I couldn't even finish a prayer. It was the scariest day of my life. It's difficult to explain to my son what's going on while there are bombs outside. When we'd go to the basement, I'd read stories to him in the candlelight. He was happy that I was with him and not out to work. Now we were spending time together. We began looking for ways to get out of there. Mikol is in a wheelchair and not very mobile. My mother has diabetes and had open wounds on both legs. We contacted the military and they couldn't send troops to certain death to evacuate us. They advised us to look for volunteers. One boy agreed if we crossed the dangerous 300 meters on our own to wait for us and provide transport. I had to make a decision. I told my mom that we're leaving in the morning. We might get killed, but if not, we just get on with our lives. In the morning we left and God was on our side. We got to safety. The boy picked us up with his car and took us to a military post. We left the war zone with a humanitarian escort. From there, by numerous train transfers, the family get to Lviv. I didn't choose Lviv. We were sent there. And so we arrived in Lviv. The problem started when we left the shelter. Kola became agitated. He started screaming incessantly. No stories, no toys could calm him down. So we had to give him a sedative. Yulia and her family live in the outskirts of Lviv, in a building with no elevator, but they're happy. Kolya's social benefits are 150 US dollars, which is not enough, but his mother now works as a teacher. A friend of mine told me about Jarello Center. I have three bachelor degrees, one of which is psychology. I started working there as an assistant, and now I'm a teacher. I take Mikola to the daycare center and go to work with a group of autistic children. Jarelo Center in Lviv is coordinating a UNICEF project that includes seven regions in the west of Ukraine. It provides support to centers working with children with disabilities from the war zone regions. Yulia and Mikola were lucky enough to end up in Jarelo, where Yulia found a job and a free daycare for Mikola. Centers with quality conditions like Jarelo are rare in Ukraine. It is funded by the government, but mostly by donations. Children rehabilitation is free of charge. We provide various sports activities. They enjoy doing puzzles and being outdoors. We try to provide an individual approach to each child. They all have different needs. They're with us till noon. After lunch, they spend time with social workers. We have two teachers, two assistants, and two social workers. We have a group of 10 children, but it's different every day. We adapt the activities according to the child's preferences and what they can learn. We're a daycare center, and parents bring the child here in the morning. We provide various activities, a short break, then classes. And if the weather is nice, we take them out for a walk. They are who they are. When I first started, they told me to get acquainted with the job and that I might decide to quit. But when I told them about Kola, who has a disability, they understood. 
The center provides a lot of opportunities, but unfortunately in Ukraine, there are not many such centers where free care is provided. We hope when the war ends, one of the priorities would be to provide more centers for those children because they are necessary. Do you have any plans? <laughs> to go home. People here are nice, the city is nice. But while walking around, I always think to myself, when I go back home, I'll do this or that. At some point, I remember that our home was destroyed. But still, I can't help but think what I'd do when we go home. With the support of the European Association of Service Providers for Persons with Disabilities,